the piano, a marvel of the industrial age. Its design, over 200 years in the making, was completed over 100 years ago. America didn't invent the piano, but it did perfect it. By the 1890s, American foundries were casting iron plates strong enough to hold the 40,000 pounds of pressure that a modern piano exerts. The heyday of the piano lasted until the Great Depression. In that time, hundreds of American firms produced millions of pianos, until a combination of the stock market crash, the world wars, and the invention of the radio and television saw a simultaneous drop in the production and the quality of the piano. The pianos of this golden era are monuments to a day gone by, when every generation played and family memories were created in the parlor room around the family piano. It was a very discerning public back then, and consequently, the quality level was high. It was a time before terms like automated, production line, entry level, plastics, MDF, or particle board were commonplace. In our modern age, lumber core production is reserved for only the highest quality furniture. In the golden era, lumber core was the standard. This was due mainly to the fact that the forests were largely untapped and lumber and large sheets of wood veneers were in abundance. Those golden era pianos are a far cry from their former glory. In most cases, the finish has faded and dried so badly that the wood is barely visible. Years of playing have taken its toll on the action, rendering the tone very weak and the touch very loose and unresponsive. Because of the 20 tons of tension pulling on the tuning pins for all those years, they are at the end of their life as well. In many instances, the piano is unable to be tuned up to the standard A440 pitch. As the tuner tightens the tuning pins, they just slip back down within a few months again. The copper wound bass strings have loosened as well, leaving the tone very dull and muddled. All of those issues might lead one to believe that they'd be better off searching out a different piano. However, the integrity of the instrument is still there, like a diamond in the rough. The case construction on those old pianos is as solid today as the day they were built. With the proper restoration, the piano can be brought back to its original grandeur, ready to be enjoyed by many generations to come. Piano restoration involves two different aspects, restoring and replacing. The integral case parts, which include the case, the soundboard, the bridges, the plate, and the keyboard are restored. The disposable moving parts, including the strings, the tuning pins, the pin block, the hammers, and other action parts are replaced. With the piano in the shop, the process begins with the disassembly process. With the disassembly complete, Attention is given to the soundboard. The soundboard is the speaker of the piano. When the hammers hit the strings, they cause them to vibrate. That vibration is taken by the bridge down to the soundboard, which vibrates in sympathy and amplifies it into audible sound. The best soundboards are made from spruce wood from Sitka, Alaska. However, many soundboards today are made from imported laminated wood to save money in the manufacturing process. Back then, all of the pianos had solid Sitka spruce soundboards. There was a pervasive myth in the piano world that a crack in the soundboard is a death sentence for the instrument. That is simply not true. It is based on the premise that sound travels across the grains of wood. If there is a crack going down the length of the soundboard, it is thought, then it will greatly inhibit the overall sound of the piano. The truth is that sound travels along and with the grains of wood. If you have two grains running together, or two grains with a crack separating them, the same amount of sound travels through them. Cracks are somewhat unsightly on a soundboard, so during the restoration process the crack is opened uniformly down its length and a spruce shim is installed, which is more aesthetically pleasing to the eye than the crack. The real issue with soundboard restoration is its relationship to the ribs. The ribs are thin strips of wood connected underneath and running perpendicular to the soundboard. Sometimes the board will come loose from the ribs, causing that area to buzz while vibrating. During the restoration process, the ribs are simply glued back to the soundboard, then the cracks are shimmed, and finally the board is refinished. 
With the soundboard restored, we shift our attention to the pin block. The pin block is not visible from the exterior of the piano, but it plays a very vital role. The strings are wrapped around the tuning pins and the pins are driven into the pin block. Pin blocks are normally made from maple laminations glued at 45 degree angles in order to ensure strength around the whole perimeter of the tuning pins. If the pin block is still in good shape, it will be retained and larger tuning pins will be driven into the same holes. More often than not, however, the pin block has evidence of being tampered with, or as rebuilders call it, juiced. Juicing is the unfortunate practice of applying a liquid solution down through the plate holes into the pin block. It has the effect of swelling the wood around the tuning pins, making them tighter in the block. It is a quick fix, but in the long run, it causes dry rot and compromises the integrity of the pin block. The only solution at this point is to replace the block. Of all the steps in the restoration process, refinishing gives you the most aesthetically striking results. In the furniture industry, the piano finish is at the very high end of the spectrum. With most furniture grade finishes, there is a two-step process of staining the wood with a pigment stain and then a satin finish is sprayed on to complete the process. With pianos, it is far more involved. First, the piano is stripped of its finish and washed with a solution to neutralize the stripping chemicals. Then, all of the damaged areas are repaired. Small nicks and dings can be repaired with wood patch, while larger damaged areas must be re-veneered or remanufactured. After the parts are repaired and sanded, a dye stain is then applied to the wood. Unlike pigment stains, which rest on top of the wood, dye stains penetrate into the wood. With the mahoganies, walnuts, and rosewoods of the golden era pianos, the dye stains accent the figure and burl and gives the wood a three-dimensional look. After the stain is applied, a wash coat of sealer is sprayed as a barrier between the dye color and the darker color of the grain filler. In order to achieve a glass smooth feel, all of the pores of the wood need to be filled. Grain filler is a substance that is worked into the pores to achieve that effect. The wash coat, if applied correctly, also sharpens the edges of the pores so the grain filler packs nicely into them. After the filler is applied, the wood is then sealed. The sealer acts as a barrier between the wood and the elements and provides a solid base for the film finish to adhere to. The film finish that best shows the beauty of the wood is nitrocellulose lacquer. After the wood is sealed, the lacquer is applied. Once the lacquer fully cures, which takes about two weeks, the final step is finishing the finish also called the rub out. The lacquer is wet sanded, then rubbed with steel wool to a glass smooth finish. With piano finishes, seven to eight coats of lacquer are initially applied so that when the finish is rubbed out, approximately four to five coats will remain to protect the wood. Too few coats of lacquer will not protect the wood properly, while too many coats will cause premature cracking in the finish. During this process, the plate is re-gilded which involves mixing the lacquer with a gold-colored bronzing powder. Once the plate is regilded and all of the embossed letters are painted black, several coats of gloss lacquer is applied to highlight the metallic look of the plate. After the case and plate are refinished, the plate and pin block are installed back into the piano. The plate is then dressed with felt and bushings and is ready for the stringing process. Once the strings are installed, it is time for the damper restoration. Just as the hammers strike the strings and produce the sound, the dampers rest on the strings and stop the sound. First, the old felts are removed. Then, the damper heads are restored and the damper wires are polished to lessen the friction during movement. The restored damper heads are then fitted to the new felts and installed into the piano. Attention is then given to the action. After the action is assembled, 
it is time to restore the keyboard. If the original keys are in bad shape, they are replaced with new plastic key tops. Only a few of the ivories needed to be replaced on this keyboard, after which they were bleached and buffed back to the original sheen. The key bushings have also been replaced along with all the keyframe felts. The action is now ready to be inserted into the piano to be regulated. There are approximately 32 adjustments in each note. Regulation is the process by which adjustments are made to each individual part in relation to each other to achieve the optimum touch and response. Once the regulation is complete, the piano is tuned several times in the shop. As with a new piano, the strings stretch quite considerably during the first several tunings. After the tunings, it is time to regulate the tone of the piano. Tone regulation is called voicing because it changes the voice of the piano. It can be likened to an equalizer on a stereo system. Just as by adjusting the treble and bass controls on a stereo, by voicing, the tone is made more or less bright, depending on the client's preference. With the tuning and voicing complete and all of the remaining case parts assembled, this piano is now restored back to its original grandeur and awaits delivery.